Hi, my name is Paul Tilstone from Festive Road, and today I'm in conversation with Eric Bailey from Microsoft. Welcome, Eric. Thank you. Happy to be here. Where are you? You're in uh, sunny Seattle, is that right? I am in Seattle, and it is sunny today. So our, we've had a late start to uh, to summer, but it's it's finally getting here. Fantastic. So uh, we've invited you on today just to give us a little insight into um, a the Microsoft program and how you're dealing with the uh, the return to travel and secondly thoughts you have on on the new normal as as we as we call it before we get to that um we've asked you to choose some components from the managed travel model to talk about to frame that conversation what is it you've chosen uh and the whole top of the triangle really focused on uh, on demand on sustainability health and safety Fantastic. We love that you've chosen the whole top of the triangle. We would expect nothing else from you, to be honest with you. So before we talk about that, just give us an insight as to where, where is the Microsoft travel program at this point in time when you're talking about the return to travel? What stage are you at? Uh, we're down quite a bit. We're at maybe 2 to 5%, somewhere in that neighborhood. So we're doing... Uh, 50, maybe 100 bookings a day maximum, and that's down from uh, what was about 2,000 before. And, and of those, we're seeing, you know, some, some relocations some people still trying to get back to their home countries. Uh, so it isn't really what we would normally see as traditional business travel. Okay. And have you fundamentally changed the, the program and the policies and things like that? Or was that already the way it's been set up after you've been able to deal with the existing situation? Our policy really is uh, is based on trust with our employees. Uh, so it's only about, you know, two and a half pages. Um, and so we really haven't made any changes to the policy. We are asking people, you know, only to travel for essential, uh, you know, things that are absolutely essential for the business to keep running data centers and things like that. Um, but no, we haven't made any, uh, any official changes to policy yet. Okay, let's go back to the, the top of the triangle. So we're talking about demand, sustainability, safety, and well-being. Why have you chosen that sort of huge chunk of topics to, to consider when, when we're looking at the future of travel? Uh, I, and I think part of it is that demand is just, I, I think is just gonna change. Uh, we saw some significant changes after, uh, after 2008 with the economic downturn, uh, just in the fundamental way that people um, both spend money and spend their time and leverage technology as an alternative. And so it took us about 10 years to get back to our previous levels of spend. And that's while, you know, you know, uh, revenues more than double the headcount, I think got, you know, was up 50, 60%. So we, we saw that, that that intensity of travel went down significantly over the last 10, 12 years. Now, I think that, that, that that's where the demand is going to change. We're, we've seen this digital transformation that you know, put two years of digital transformation to two months. And so what people expect and how people are used to working remotely has just fundamentally changed. So that's on the demand side that I think that's absolutely gonna be, uh, uh, be different. Uh, I think on the, on the safety and the, and the health and the sustainability, all those kind of go together. And what we're seeing with sustainability and what I think that we as travel managers are gonna have to do is become a little bit of untravel managers and say that it is not, our primary goal is not just getting people back on the road. Our primary goal is helping people to be productive. And some of that is gonna be leveraging technology also. I may have a technology bias though, you know, considering my company. Well, just you, you would expect you to have really, but I mean, on that point, I guess, um, you know, some people might find it quite surprising as, as a technology company, as an, an organization that has virtual collaboration platforms, you, you would expect that your travel program was, was sort of finely honed so that it's only kind of um, absolutely necessarily travel that occurs anyway. But, but you're talking here about um, quite a considerable cut. So why, why is that happening? Why do you believe that would happen? I mean, we were at, if you look at the uh, T&E to revenue, we were at about 0. 0.5, 0.6% of revenue was spent on T&E. And if you compare that to some of the big consulting companies, those can be at 5 or 6%. So yeah, we were already pretty low. I think what we're finding is that the, the productivity of people working remotely is definitely changing and being acknowledged. That the time to go on the road, to go to a, a one-hour, two-hour meeting you might lose a day of time there. And so I think people are considering how they can become more productive 
balance their lives out a little better. We still haven't figured that one out yet. Uh, the the work life balance seems to just all mesh together. But I think that we'll we'll get to a point where we're able to balance these things a little better and use travel where it makes sense and invest in that travel where it makes sense, but not to just automatically default to it. So, so do you think that the, um, the sort of, I think, what did you say, two years of change within, within two months, do you think it's, it's because we've all gone through this change together as well, that actually the expectation has shifted now, that people, people don't necessarily expect you to, to travel, to be in front of them, that, that you, you, the default, as you say, the default is now virtual rather than face-to-face, it's, it's switched. That's what we're seeing. I don't think every industry is necessarily going to be like that, right? You can't uh, uh, you can't work in a lab uh, remotely. You can't uh, fix a windmill remotely. So some of these things aren't going to change, and you can't do them virtually. Others, I think you can, and I think we'll see a change in the dynamic of what that uh, what those meetings are. That just getting basic information back and forth in a meeting is probably not why people are going to travel. It's going to be more about that relationship building. I think it'll be easier to say we're going to have a team meeting just so we can hang out together and get to know each other. That we don't have to say, here's our big agenda of things that we're going to be delivering. And that's why I need this, you know, $10,000 of budget. It's this is so we can work better as a team as we work virtually. So I think you'll see some of that too, that investment in making the, the travel valuable for the most valuable parts of the travel, which is that face-to-face connection. So if, I mean, going back to your sort of, uh, I know sort of finger in the air figures when you're talking about other businesses, but you're saying your travel to revenue is 0.5%. Other businesses, you're talking about 5%. If you envisage a considerable cut within uh, your type of program, the potential for other types of programs where the, the ratio is higher has to be even more exacerbated or, or actually, to your point, it depends on the type of travel and the type of culture of the business as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so so the, the, you'll, you'll see different businesses. Consulting will be different than manufacturing, will be different than technology. But I think, um, and one thing that you've brought up there, uh, brought the my other side of the view <laughs> into this, which as you know, these days you just, it's a big pendulum that swings back and forth every day. But um, part of it is looking at what if that little bit of travel, what if cutting that, you know, from 0.5% to 0.4% impacts revenue? It doesn't have to impact it much, right? And what if it impacts creativity? What if it impacts the innovation? And those are the things that we need to be really careful about. Those are difficult to see immediately. But I think those are the, both the opportunities in the travel space and the, and the risks for companies that cut too much is that by isolating people that you end up uh, losing some of those innovations, some of those new ideas with the people that you don't normally talk to. So do you, do you think that uh, if you're talking about the travel manager thinking about untravel, do they also need to start uh, connecting much deeper with the components in the business that are responsible for monitoring the creativity of the business, of the revenue of the business, um, so that they can kind of make sure that, the, that when travel, if travel doesn't come back to the same level, that it's not affecting those components? Or is that someone else's job? I'm just interested in that perspective on that. Uh, we need to be the consultants on that, certainly. And we need to raise that as an issue, because I think if you look from a, from a financial perspective, somebody, somebody's going to say, you know, we just found hundreds of millions of dollars. This is free money. This is going to go to the bottom line. This is going to be great. But I think understanding with those, uh, you know, with the, the creativity, the innovation, some of those things, you might have to, you make, need to make sure that part is brought, uh, brought to light also. I don't know how you measure those. I don't see how you, how you quickly can understand if a company has become less innovative. I understand over time, that's pretty obvious. It's, it's going to be a challenge to show that over, you know, a month or two. And what about the relationship with suppliers? I mean, the, you know, I mean, good travel managers have deep relationships and they understand that volumes will, will flex depending on the, the company's um, success and behaviors. But um, if you, it, what you're talking about here is a sort of longer term reduction in travel and potentially, you know, never getting back to the volumes that were there before. So what does that do to the relationship? How do you, how do you manage that? Well, I think part of it, we're looking for other innovative solutions as to how we can, uh, um, how we can work with these partners, 
right? So what it might mean is maybe less long haul flights, but maybe more meetings that are set in multi-regional locations. So you might have more flights, but they're just shorter flights. You might have the same number of hotel nights that are just in different places. You might have hotels being used, and we've been talking to hotel companies now about, you know, are there ways that we can have these joint hybrid meetings where you can bring in technology, some people remotely, some people socially distance in place, and how do you bring all of these together? And so it's looking at our suppliers and figuring out better ways that we can leverage them. And I think you'll also find out that we'll find out the, uh, we'll, we'll discover the most valuable suppliers, the ones that are really willing to work with us. And those are gonna be the ones that we really wanna work with also. So it's, it's interesting because it, it means that actually the role of the, the travel manager, the expert on the, the, the interaction between the travel market and your corporate objectives and internal culture actually is, is potentially more important because it's not just a sourcing exercise then, is it? It's about a, a shift in behavior and trying to get the suppliers to match their products to the new need. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And I mean, the, the example that I use is if, uh, if you think of the old days, I'll meet you down in the hotel lobby and then we'll just talk for a few minutes. Somebody's late, somebody's trying to get there, you can't find a place to seat, it, it's loud, you know, all that sort of stuff. What if you knew you had a place where you could set down, you had a whiteboard, it doesn't have to be a whole conference room, but you knew you had that space from this time to this time. That, that's a different dynamic. That's something that people will be willing to pay for. Ideally, we'll be able to repurpose some of those other travel budgets for things like that also. So I think that there's, there's ways like that that we can look at, and, and that's that making the meeting more valuable. So instead of you, know, you and I sitting down in Amsterdam somewhere and it being a, a meeting where we don't get much done, what if we can make it really, really productive in those you know, 30 or 60 minutes that we have? So um, I'm interested in your view on, I mean, we've been using these virtual platforms now for three months. I mean, obviously we've been using them for a long time, but this has been our sole way of interacting. Do you think there's any danger we've, we're overstating the change in people's behaviors and that that maybe means that travel will come back more than you're thinking? I, I think you will see a lot of travel come back. I mean, I, I think that one thing that we have learned is that it is so valuable to get some of that face-to-face. -face. I think how we look at it and which we find are absolutely essential, those are going to be the questions. And yeah, that's the thing that's going to vary from industry to industry. And some people may find, I mean, the, the elusive ROI of travel will potentially be discovered now. And, and I think that some people may find that that travel was the best investment they ever made. Other people were like, I didn't need to spend 70% of that money. And then you'll get a, a balance out and that'll work out over time. But I think it, it is going to be a fundamental shift of how people look at it, though. Yeah, it's funny. I had a conversation the other day with someone who said that uh, they worked for a law firm and uh, one of the partners said that they, they, instead of flying to Australia to sign a contract, uh, actually, they, uh, they managed to sign it virtually uh, and I was sort of slightly amazed by that because I, I figured like don't people do that anyway but I guess there's there's a lot of inherent behaviors that, that actually to your point this three-month period has, has fundamentally shifted their minds on how they can do business in the future what about about what about carbon just, what just real quickly we're still doing yeah. mergers and acquisitions so yeah. you can actually buy a company uh, while without meeting people face to face yes so, I mean, I think that that's, that's the ultimate sort of, you know, leverage of saying, do you need to be there? That's something in the past you would have said, I absolutely need to be there. There's no way to do it without that. And I think that's, that, that's one of those things that's changed. Yeah. Okay. Um, just this, before we finish, touch on sustainability and uh, measuring your carbon footprint. Do you see any fundamental changes in, in how you, you're going to need to go about that? How any sustainability efforts as travel starts to come back? Uh, sustainability is still huge for us. We're still looking at sustainable air fuel. Uh, we're still looking at ways, you know, we made a huge commitment in, uh, in January that we'd be reducing our carbon um, and in, in, in real ways and sustainable ways, not just buying offsets. So making those investments is something that I think we're going to uh, continue to see. And I think that the reduction in travel and traveling smarter, right, and that might be taking fewer trips but longer trips. It might be, you know, different ways of doing things that are going to have a, a smaller carbon footprint is going to be absolutely essential moving forward. And, and we certainly as a company see that as a long-term goal that we absolutely need to commit to. 
Is there, a, is there a tendency maybe, though, for companies to to look at their massively reduced travel this year and go, tick, hey, we ticked the sustainability box this year, and, and, and therefore all the, all the sort of drivers for change that were pre-COVID – Actually, there's a there's a pause on those because everybody's everybody's achieving their sustainability targets. Uh, the question is, do we want to take advantage of this moment in time to to make a shift in those sustainability targets, right? And do we want to say we are going to do things in a different way? And I think we've shown that we can do them in a different way. And I think that now it's how do we do that in a different way, and how do we balance that in a responsible way moving forward? So do you think that there, there could be, whereas before it might have been a target to reduce by, say, 10% per year, do you think that, that companies might instigate targets that say, actually, our target for 2021 is 50% less carbon uh, footprint than it was in 2019? Like, take advantage of the big reduction. I would doubt because we'll, we will see some of that, uh, uh, you know, that ramping back up again for most companies. Yeah. So, and it depends on if the companies are primarily travel. So travel is a pretty small part of our footprint. Um, you know, it's the data centers and real estate that are the, the real big footprints there. Yeah. So, but we're seeing shifts in real estate also, right? We're seeing, you know, data centers more and more is how do we get more of that uh, renewable energy? Um, so all of those things are still pushing forward. What you've had is a chance to change those, those uh, views, those targets. And I think you adjust and say, before, we, if we would have said, could we reduce travel by 50%, everybody would have said that's absolutely impossible. And the you know, good and bad thing now, depending on where you are in the industry, is that we've proven it's possible. Yeah. But to your point, it, it's the, um, in sustainability terms, it's also an acceleration of two years of work into two months as well. But um, before we close up, is there any lessons, given what you've been through over the last couple of months, that uh, you think it's useful for other travel managers to, to know that you've experienced anything you can impart to help people as they plan for the return to travel? Um, I, I think it's that, and, and I'll, I'll tell you one thing that we, uh, we were focusing on a lot before was making travel predictive and the booking process predictive. So we would guess what you were going to do. I know you're probably going to fly this airline, stay at this hotel, visit this office, that sort of thing. And the shift has gone from being predictive to being predictable. Because now what you want to know is how many people are on the elevator? Can I take the stairs? Who's my driver? When was the car cleaned? When was the hotel cleaned? Who cleaned it? You know, all of these things that you're going to see a, it, it, it's a lot of the same stuff. It's still, and you know, I always am going to fall back on data. It's all data and how do we share it and how do we leverage it? But it's just for a slightly different use. The good thing is that's going to give us all the stuff we want after we get out of the crisis too, right? That's going to give us that predictability so that it's easier to meet people, to find people, to get a ride, to share rides, to, you know, get to the airport, to meet people there, you know, all of those things. If we can pull this together, all those are going to um, really tie together well also. I love the predictive to predictable. That's a really smart mantra. Um, we'll leave you to get to your breakfast because I know it's relatively early there now and the family's rising. Um, Eric, thank you very much for, for joining us today. Yep, absolutely. Uh, happy to join and uh, thanks for the conversation. My pleasure. So uh, thanks for watching uh, the Return to Travel series. Uh, you will find the permissible travel framework on the festive-road.com website. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks very much.